Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for your patience while we worked out some technical difficulties. You know, Zoom is great and technology is great until it doesn't work. So we got past that. We're so excited that you're here. We have a special guest with us today. If you're new to our channel, I'm Tammy from Nutmeg Notebook. My husband, Tom, is here. He might pop on screen in a few minutes. Uh, he will help moderate the chat. If you have questions today, we welcome your questions. You can put those in the chat. We just ask that you would preface those with two or three question marks and end with two or three question marks. That just helps the questions pop out for us. We know you guys get chatty with one another in the chat feed. That's great. We encourage that, but we don't want to miss your questions. So we will be talking um, all about the new Ultimate Vegan Health and Weight Loss Bundle today and content that is in there. You guys know how excited I am about this. And we have a special guest with us today, Stephanie Spencer. She is a registered nurse and she is a certified lifestyle medicine practitioner with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And I know that many of you are very familiar with that organization. And she is going to be sharing with us today all about her plant-based jumpstart course, which I'm very excited about. And so please, Tom, if you would bring on uh, Stephanie Spencer for us. There she is. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Well, yeah, Tom and Tammy, thank you so much for having me on your channel. I'm really excited. But, um, but yeah, my name is Stephanie Spencer. I'm a former cardiac nurse of 27 years. I did chronic disease management my entire adult life. And then um, my husband developed diabetes. I had heard about plant-based nutrition from the What the Health documentary. We switched to a plant-based diet and um, reversed his diabetes. It was just pre-diabetes, but reversed it within like four months. And uh, so then I was just hooked. I went on to learn a whole bunch more. I got certified through the T. Colin Campbell program. And, and then I went on to get a board certification uh, through American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So yeah, I love nothing more than sharing with people about chronic disease reversal. So um, yeah, so let me tell you real quick about uh, what I have in the bundle. I have my uh, plant-based jumpstart course, and this is everything you need to know to get started, plus my, a two-hour video of, uh, it's called, Where Do You Get Your Protein? And I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about that today. And so it's going to be way more in depth my, in my course than what I'm doing today. But um, and my course is really good for folks that I, I have worked my entire life. I'm from Arkansas uh, and with Arkansans that have heart disease. Like that's my that's my demographic. Right. And so all of my material is geared towards people that have really never heard this before. And so my my course, that the video that I have is really good. If you have like a skeptical spouse or someone that's just not on the same page with you, just show them that video. But in addition to that video, the Jumpstart course has like a pantry prep shopping list. Um, and it has a, a lab work uh, worksheet that you can plug in your labs. And you're going to see where you need to aim for to get chronic disease reversal progress. And then I also have um, resources for your non-plant-based physician. So my course is really good. A lot of people are, you know, you're in the middle of uh, the country. <laughs> there no, you have no board certified lifestyle physicians around. And but my premise is that you can really do a lot with your existing family practice doctor. Um, your doctor will be thrilled as you start to get better and better with plant-based nutrition, and then they just need to down titrate your meds. And so um, I have a little print off that you can hand your family practice doctor that lets them know that there's an entire organization called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And and um, it, it speaks to them like peer to peer. Um, and there's also like a little uh, clickable link you have about a type two, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's type two diabetes uh, position paper on uh, that we believe that type two diabetes, we should seek for a remission instead of just managing symptoms for years and years. So there's a lot of resources to give to your physician as well and just get you on the right track. So um, so yeah, that's, that's what I've got in the bundle. But what I want to do today is talk a little bit about, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, here we go. Okay. Come on. There's always that there we go. Okay. All right. Hey, we got it. Okay. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is the reason why humans don't tend to tolerate even what is considered normal and healthy animal proteins um, like chicken and salmon. So it's called what's wrong with a healthy chicken salmon diet, right? Because we all know, and I worked in the medical field for, you know, like 27 years. I don't know any doctor or any nurse that thinks that pizza and cheeseburgers is good for you. We all consider this junk, right? And when our patients come to us and they're really sick and they always are, we say, stop eating the junk food. That's what I did for 20 years. I ran an outpatient heart failure clinic. So I try to get my patients to stop eating their fast junk food. And then I tell them to eat healthy things like chicken and salmon, right? Doesn't that look beautiful? What could be wrong with it, right? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. What is wrong with even the healthy version of animal protein, our chicken salmon diets? So um, we're going to start off talking about Dr. T. Colin Campbell, who is kind of the godfather of plant-based nutrition. He is the one that really discovered, he spent his entire career studying the link between animal protein and human nutrition and, and human health. And so he started out in the working in the Philippines for the U.S. government and um, there was a lot of malnutrition in the Philippines and uh, there were children that were very malnourished and, and probably didn't have enough protein. And so whenever you see something like this terrible picture of a malnourished child, you think like, well, they need some protein. And that's what Dr. Campbell. What happened? We lost her, we get her back. Oh. Here she comes. Oh. Here she is. Tammy, did something happen there? Yeah, something yeah. happened. The screen went. My screen share went away? Yeah. Let's try this again. Okay. I'm going to talk in this, in my presentation about how awful computers are too. So, <laughs> all right. I don't have Tom skills. I If I had a Tom, man, oh gosh. But yeah, oh, I, I'm stuck with doing my- great barely hanging on here. But anyway, so um, yeah, so there were these malnourished children in the Philippines. Dr. T. Colin Campbell was trying to help help with this malnutrition problem. He assumed they needed protein, right? Like who wouldn't? And so, um, however, there he noticed this phenomenon. A lot of the children, there were a lot of peanuts that uh, people ate in the Philippines. And all of the children pretty much routinely ate peanut butter, but he found out that the peanut butter supply was contaminated with this thing called aflatoxin, which is a naturally occurring mold and, um, and it's carcinogenic. And so um, he made this correlation. He heard anecdotal reports of just um, like clearly the malnourished children are very impoverished and are getting hardly any uh, protein. But then there were also children that were wealthier and had more like Western levels of animal protein, like maybe about 20% of their caloric intake. And he started hearing reports that these wealthier children were actually getting um, reports of liver cancer. And so he, he hypothesized that, and he also drew on a previous study in India that maybe pointed towards this. He hypothesized that given that like everyone in this population is, has, has exposure to this carcinogen, maybe it's the different levels of animal protein that determine whether they get cancer or don't get cancer. Okay. And so he went on to conduct some studies in rats. Cause like, clearly we can't just like inject humans with carcinogens and then do things like that. So he did this on uh, groups of rats. Uh, he fed all of the rats a, um, what's, uh, a, Oh, I'm sorry, he injected all of the rats with aflatoxin with the carcinogen, okay? But then he fed them, there were two groups and they had different levels of protein in their diet. The protein they were getting was casein, which is a milk protein, an animal protein. And I don't know if you can see my little mouse here, but this group here, the 5% group of rats that was getting 5% of their calories in animal protein, that's a low amount of animal protein. They all had aflatoxin, the carcinogen injected, none of the 5% group developed cancer. But then there was a group of rats that he fed a 20% protein diet of the casein and all injected with aflatoxin. Guess what? Every single one of these 20% rats developed cancer pretty quickly. It just bloomed. 
Okay. So then he got the 20% rat, the 20% protein group and dropped them down to 5% protein. Guess what? The cancer shriveled up. Then he put them right back on 20% and the cancer started growing again. And Dr. Campbell said it was as if he could turn on and turn off cancer based on the amount of protein that he gave the rats. And the reason these the rats are significant because in the uh, research community, it's assumed that anything that causes cancer in rats and mice causes cancer in humans. So they do the cancer study on rats. Um, so what is the mechanism? Like, how is it that this happens? And so a good way to understand cancer progression is to look at these three phases, initi initiation, promotion, and progression. So initiation happens when we get exposed to a carcinogen. A carcinogen is just anything that causes cancer. And carcinogens are what we all kind of think of as carcinogens, like pesticides, um, things like asbestos, you know, uh, cigarette smoke can be a carcinogen. Um, actually uh, processed meat, your turkey wraps are a class one carcinogen uh, rated by the World Health Organization or group one carcinogen. So these things will mutate our regular cells into a genetically altered cancer cell, okay? And our immune system works pretty well to detect these like cancer cells that get into our body and our immune system will zap them basically and eliminate them. But Every now and again, like 99.9% .9 of the time, our immune system takes care of it, but 0.001% of the time, a cell will get passed, a mutated cancer cell will get passed, and then it's going to nestle somewhere in our body, and then it'll start to double in size, okay? So this is the promotion phase when cancer cells start to grow and grow by doubling, right? And so what Dr. Campbell found is that this is the most significant phase. This is wh what determines how fast cancer grows. And to be clear, we all have cancer, okay? We, have, we all have tiny mutated cancer cells in our body, but we want to be eating food that will starve cancer. We don't want to fertilize cancer with our food. And so it usually takes about eight to 10 years for a cluster of cancer cells to develop into a mass or a tumor that's visible to the human eye. And so that's when we find tumors like on ultrasound or on you know, CT scan or PET scan. Um, we find it on a scan and that's what we call early detection. That's, that's what we do. Oh, let's do screenings for early detection. When you do an early detection of a cancer, it's been around for eight to 10, it's been growing for eight to 10 years. So cancers are usually found when they're really at a late stage. So if we don't want to get cancer, we need to create an environment that does not promote the cancer, right? And so um, what Dr. Campbell found is that it's not genes that promote the, the cancer that make it grow quickly. It's, it's the diet. It's the nutritional environment that promotes or suppresses cancer, okay? Um, and uh, so, yeah, and it's important to know that in, our, in America, men have a 47% lifetime chance of getting cancer and women have a 38% lifetime chance of getting cancer, sitting in an oncologist's office and having a scary conversation. It's a number two cause of death. So um, this is 51 years after President Nixon's war on cancer. How come we haven't made any progress in the war on cancer? Joe Biden also launched his 21st Century Cures Act and um, we're not really, when, when a president launches a quote unquote war on cancer, that means let's find a magical drug that we can just take this pill and it will cure the cancer, right? So that's what the problem is. And uh, so Dr. T. Colin Campbell also correlated these rat studies, you know, the, the two different rates, like, well, it's normal to say like, these are rats, why would we you know, like take this seriously. He then um, took these findings and did studies uh, in a human population in the China study. And the China study is the most comprehensive nutritional study ever done in the medical literature. And um, he studied like 65 different counties, hundreds of thousands of people, and he drew 8,000 statistically significant conclusions from the China study in the human population. But what he found is that um, the people that ate the most animal protein ended up having the most disease so that there was a, a direct correlation between it was the animal protein between getting higher rates of cancer, higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of diabetes, all these chronic diseases that are usually the number one causes of death in our society. So, um, 
in the pharmacology world. And then Dr. Campbell also worked. So as soon as he like made, like back in the Philippines days, when he made this correlation with the rats, the first thing they thought to do was like, well, let's find the one mechanism by which animal protein promotes cancer, find out why that is, and we're gonna block it with a drug. And so Dr. T. Colin Campbell did lots of research trying to find one way, to, a way to block this cancer promoting mechanism with a drug. And um, so he searched and searched to find what is the one mechanism of action. And guess what he found? He found that animal protein acts on cancer promotion by increasing the rate of entry of the carcinogen into the cell. Well, there you go. That's what the problem is, okay? Except that, oh, it also increases mixed function oxidase synthesis and alters the MFO structure. Basically, this means it activates the carcinogen faster. Wait, we've got more and more problems here. The carcinogen, when we have a high animal protein environment, has increased binding to the DNA. The, in a high protein environment, carcinogen, the, it decreases the body's ability to repair DNA. Okay. Uh, a high animal pro, and when I say a high animal protein environment, that's what we consider a normal animal protein environment, just a reasonable amount of meat on lunch and dinner. Okay. That's enough to lower our natural killer cells. Natural killer cells kill cancer. Okay. Um, uh, 20% animal protein increases cancer cell replication. It also increases inflammation and it also increases IGF, uh, insulin-like growth factor one hormone. And this is a hormone um, when we eat the am amino acid configuration of complete animal protein, all animal protein, no matter how organically it's raised and perfectly we raise these cows or whatever and the eggs, um, when we eat animal protein, it's going to make our liver kick out high levels of insulin like growth factor one and IGF one is going to put our bodies in the mood to grow blood vessels. And so if we have a little cluster of cancer cells in our colon or in our breast, and they're able to get a really healthy blood supply because we're eating lots of animal protein, then those cancer cells are going to grow really fast. Okay. That's a problem. And it also, also alters calorie use. So basically what Dr. Campbell found out is that there's not one mechanism of action. There's 10 mechanisms of action that he identified here. This it's not just as cut and dried as the pharmacology world would have us believe. Okay. Cause they want to find out which one of these can we hit with a drug. So in order to understand like, why this doesn't work, we need to understand the difference between complicated and complex systems. Okay. Like we had all this trouble with the zoom right beforehand because the, like all of these little computer programs, all of our computers are complicated systems. Computers are fully predictable, right? Like we just had to find out which little thing we had to click to make the zoom work. But in the progress of a complicated system can be charted by cause and effect. You do the right input, the right thing will happen every single time. You do the wrong thing, the wrong thing happens, but we can just fix it by figuring out what the problem is. Like sending a rocket ship to the moon, that's a complicated system. Look at Apollo 13, the movie. Computers are complicated. You spill a glass of water on your computer, it's done. <laughs> I've done that before. <laughs> It, a computer cannot repair itself. It's a complicated system. It has to maintain these same parameters to be able to function as a complicated system. And drugs are a complicated system, okay? Um, they act on one mechanism of action and they assume that that will solve the problem. But complex systems are based on relationships and they have self-organization. They're interconnected. Um, they're adaptive and they are capable of self-repair if they're given the right conditions. That's what we always say. The body will heal itself if you just stop hurting yourself. So agriculture is a complex system. Botany, um, human beings, human health, human physiology, and even human disease processes are very complex systems. It's not just a, this one thing went wrong. We apply this one solution. And nutrition is also a complex system. It's, and so I recommend that you look at the book, um, Dr. T. Colin Campbell's book, Whole, um, in W-H-O-L-E. He explains how nutrition is so complex. And really, no, like in the medical field, we don't understand nutrition at that level at all. Like there's very few people that do. And, um, and he just explains how like you just can't fix these things with like one drug. That's not going to put you in the right direction. You have to eat the right food. 
So yeah, the drugs target one mechanism of action, like in that, that list of those 10 cancer causing reasons, but they drugs have multiple side effects. Okay. But with diet, a diet, the correct diet, when we feed ourselves the right fuel, the diet acts on all the mechanisms of health and it doesn't have any side effects. So the problem with drugs and why they're not frequently that effective is that with drugs, we're treating a complex system, humans, with a complicated tool, the drug. When we treat humans with the correct diet, we're treating a complex system with a complex tool. Okay. So that was Dr. Campbell's epiphany that, that there's not just one mechanism of disease and the relationship between animal protein and cancer, but it's also like, I come from a cardiac background. There's not just one mechanism between diet and heart disease either. Like with heart disease, it's promoted by uh, TMAO. It's promoted by, which is like this inflammatory compound that comes from our gut. It's, it's promoted by um, cholesterol buildup. It's promoted by inflammation. There's so many different causes. We can't just treat like the one thing, the cholesterol number and expect everything to get better. And it doesn't. Um, so the relationship between food and human health acts like a symphony. That was Dr. Colin, Dr. T. Colin Campbell's epiphany there. And like a symphony, you can't just like <laughs> figure out each little sound, computerize it, and then produce the same thing. This is a complex system produced by complex human beings. That's why we say, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. It's, um, you, you need to give your body the right fuel. And you may be asking, how do I find out? How am I going to do all this? <laughs> you know, if you're new to plant-based nutrition and my answer is do whatever Tammy says, <laughs> do, but that's where something like the bundle that, that we're promoting this week is really going to come in handy because everything in this bundle, this whole food plant-based, no oil world here, this is all based on research from plant-based pioneers like Dr. Campbell, like Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, like Dr. Neil Bernard, Dr. Dean Ornish. Um, but it's, it's all the same diet for all these different, like we come at it from different ways, uh, different, like Dr. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn worked on heart disease. T. Colin Campbell worked on protein and cancer, uh, but it's, it's all the same diet that works for everything. So um, that's why the bundle, you'll have so many, about 5,000 recipes. Tammy's batch cooking just is going to, you know, make everything super easy because you have to cook a lot of your own food. It's hard to find this out in the real world. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's why you need to check out the whole bundle. And I want to say one more thing before I turn this over to Tammy. So I know I've been sitting here trying talking about how uh, ineffective drugs are. However, I want you to know in the real clinical world, okay, the way we get off of drugs is first step one, start eating whole food plant-based meals without oil. Okay. That will start to treat the underlying cause of your problems. Then your conditions will start to get better and better, but you need to be under the care of a physician to get off of your meds. So as your condition improves, we always have your meds calibrated to the level of crappiness of your diet. And as your diet improves, <laughs> then your, your, the meds are going to become too strong for you. And so you need to go to your doctor. And what I recommend you do is go to your doctor. I kind of spell this out in my course that you can get through the bundle, but you need to tell them like, you are ready to take control of your health. You're going to do this plant-based diet. Um, and you expect these things to get better, especially if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, these things will improve rapidly. And if we don't have orders to like, start to down titrate your meds, uh, we don't want you to fall down and hit your head. Okay. <laughs> and, and that just means your meds are too strong. And what we want to do is down titrate them. And so usually we'll just wean down gradually. And then under your doctor's supervision, once we can get these chronic diseases turned around, then we can go off of the meds, but never, never, never say, I'm going to go on a plant-based diet and then throw all your pills away. Don't ever do that because you can really hurt yourself. So, um, yeah, that's, thank you for coming to my Ted talk. That is <laughs> all that I've got here, but, um, yeah, so I'm going to turn you over to Tammy and we're going to see what amazing thing she's eaten for lunch today. Let me do my stop share. I'm going to be sitting for a minute. There we go. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Stephanie, that was amazing. That is one of the best presentations about protein that I have ever seen. And I've been doing this for 10 years. So that was excellent. And I have a number of people that I want to hear this. So, you know, the keto diet is so popular right mm -hmm. now. I have family members right now that are doing it. And do you know, like what's happening with the people 
that are doing keto, what, what's happening to their cholesterol and right. their blood pressure and the incidence of cancer? Do you know? Well, so, and that's the thing. So a keto diet, you will lose weight very rapidly. Okay. So we have two mechanisms going on here. Um, in fact, like I did, <laughs> I did the Adkins diet like 20 years ago. Right. And I was, when I did it, I, I was skinnier than I am now. Like I, I'm perfectly happy with my weight. Like I'm not in a, how can I, how insanely skinny can I be contest? But, um, but it's very effective at weight loss. And so the, the, the problem with the keto diet is things will initially, if you lose a lot of weight, a lot of things will get better. Okay. But you, you will lose weight. You can even increase, like, you know, you can improve your diabetes and stuff, but the whole time you're going to be adding more and more layers of fat. Now I'm going to be on chef AJ on Wednesday and I'm going to explain how diabetes works. Okay. And I'm going to explain this whole, so watch chef AJ on Wednesday, but um, yeah, so you're going to, because of the weight loss, some things will get better, but then we're laying down more fat. And so, and, and plus a keto getting all your, all this meat, meat is intrinsically inflammatory. Okay. It's got bacterial endotoxins. They are not destroyed with food. Um, this is like kind of like the casing that's around all the fecal coliforms that are in your meat and stuff. So, um, so like they radiate it in the slaughterhouse, but then you're still going to have these inflammatory products that you can't get rid of no matter what uh, heterocyclic amines in the meat are um, also inflamed. So we just have all these inflammatory producing compounds. We're getting too much cholesterol. We know in heart disease that the correlation is cholesterol levels. Okay. If you have a cholesterol level below 150, you can smoke, you can be a couch potato. You're not going to develop heart disease. It's all about the cholesterol. So um, this is what Dr. Clifford Roberts um, famously said in the, in the journal of the American College of Cardiology. But um, yeah, the, <laughs> you will lose weight, but your goal is not to fit into a skinny casket. There's been a meta-analysis done on keto diets and they showed that, I think it was that had a 35% higher death rate people that were on a keto diet. So yeah, you'll look skinny but at a great expense to your health. You can lose weight by doing cocaine, by getting six months of chemo. There's lots of really bad ways to lose weight and keto is one of them, yeah. And do you know what effect is it having on um, people with diabetes? Going so keto what, will all happen, that what will happen is that you are not eating any sugar, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and you're eating very, you know, like hardly any carbs. So everything you're putting in your mouth is going to be a low glycemic food. Okay. And so what will happen is people that do a keto diet, their A1C will even improve that the hemoglobin A1C is a long-term measure of your blood sugar. Okay. And so if like, if I pick a certain day, and I say from here on out, I am never going to eat a potato. I'm never going to eat um, anything that really turns into sugar. I'm going to, you know, like limit my fruit or whatever. Then you can make your sugar not go very high by always having a high fat diet because fat will blunt the sugar absorption. Okay. Fat and fiber will slow down the rate with which sugar goes into your bloodstream. So they're like getting all the fat, right? And so if I go three months on a keto diet, my average daily blood sugar is going to be low. And so your hemoglobin A1C will quote unquote improve, okay? And people will be like, ha ha, it works and I'm eating bacon. You know, you're the sucker, <laughs> right? Right. However, you will not survive a glucose tolerance test, okay? Because you are you are accommodating your insulin resistance because insulin resistance is really happens when fat builds up on the muscle cells. Okay. And so we're eating all this meat. You're going to have more and more fat building up, but you're just not eating any sugar. So you're probably going to require more and more metformin, more and more insulin, but your sugar levels are going to seem like they're fine. Right. But then if we said, okay, do a glucose tolerance test. Any women that have been pregnant, like we all have to go through glucose tolerance tests, right? Or like eat a, eat a bag of Skittles, right? If I ate Skittles right now, I'm not diabetic. My blood sugar is not going to go much higher than 140 because I'm very insulin sensitive and my insulin's going to kick in and knock that sugar down. It's going to, it's going to propel the sugar in the bloodstream to go into my cells. If someone on a keto diet 
with an A1C of like 6.2 that's like controlling their A1C eats a bag of Skittles, your sugar's going to go to 500, 600. It, it'll skyrocket up because you are so insulin resistant and that's not a normal state for human beings. Okay. And so, um, so it's, it's not good, uh, for <laughs> yeah. Insulin sensitivity. It's not good. You will require higher and higher levels of meds. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that's a good explanation because I know someone who went on the keto, they were borderline diabetic. And then they were telling me, you know, it's working for me. What can I tell you? You know, my A1C is looking better and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. And I, then I thought, okay, so what's going to happen long-term? So, so thank you for that explanation. That's very good. I'm, I have people I'm going to have watch this video. That was Excellent. Thank you so much. And lots of wonderful comments going on in the chat feed about your presentation and what a great find um, to have you on today. And, um, and I couldn't agree more everybody. <laughs> well, so follow me. I'm going to be doing this all week long. Like I've, I'm meeting with different like chefs and different people and just talking about different little concepts. Cause like in my experience, like when you talk about a plant-based diet in the regular world, you know, like people are like, I just don't know. It seems so unnatural. They think they're going to get sick. They're not going to get their protein, you know, that whole thing. And so lots of times people just need to understand one concept. Like I've had patients referred to me and they like, I have a little video about my, what you're going to see on chef AJ on Wednesday. Um, but, uh, and they're like, once you explained it that way, I'll tell you, I get a little sieve and I have it covered with lard. And then I like melt the fat out with some water. Anyway, it's kind of cool. But they're like, once I saw that, then I under like, they just intuitively understand how it works. And then they're like, okay, what do I need to eat? But you have to grasp this concept because it really is like contrary to everything we've ever been taught. So yeah. follow me, like my YouTube channel is natural state plant-based and um, also on Facebook, but I just have a bunch of these little videos that, um, that just to explain to regular people, all these disease reversal concepts. Yeah. Fantastic. And underneath the video here on YouTube, in what we call the show notes or the description, right. we have links to all of your um, social media platforms, your website, and everything. So you guys, you can click on the see more or there might be a down Chevron, depending on what device you're looking mm -hmm. at, or a down arrow. And then you can find links um, so that you can follow Stephanie and please share her information yeah. with your friends and relatives who need to hear what she is saying. And I'll also um, tell you, I have another link to in the show notes. I just sent it to Tom, but it's a link to the an original YouTube of Dr. Campbell explaining everything I talked about. It's, it's like more complex the way he explains it, but it's like a two hour in-depth video. Mine's just a short summary. So you can, yeah. you can see that he, too, put to, that. he already put that in. Yeah. So he it should be it. in the show notes. So watch mm -hmm. that video. Yeah. He mm -hmm. added that. Okay. Well, we are going to talk about the food next. I think we make, we make a pretty good pair here because mm -hmm. um, she, she said everything up for it. So my contribution to the bundle. And we're, we're talking about this amazing bundle where the, there's like 122 different pieces of digital content that you guys will get valued at over $6,500. And it's selling for $49, which is just like pretty incredible. And there's all kinds of different content in there from learning, you know, yoga and learning how to work out and how to declutter your house. And we have a lot of physicians who also have contributed courses and created books and just, I mean, it's huge. There's over 2000 recipes in it. All of the recipes are oil-free. There could be some salt or sugar, but we all know we can leave salt out of a recipe. No problem. If you come across a recipe that uses sugar and you don't know how to convert it, you know, skip that recipe because there is going to be 1,999 more recipes that you can probably use. So what we created for it is a batch cooking course, and we're calling it a master class. It has 32 videos in it um, because I wanted to teach you guys how to batch prep so that this is sustainable long-term. So I went plant-based 10 years ago, 
And I was overwhelmed in the beginning because I was spending so much time in the kitchen every day. And I knew this is how I wanted to eat. I knew I needed to eat this way. I knew that Tom needed to eat this way. But I, I thought this isn't sustainable. I cannot start dinner at three o'clock every day because when you get healthy and you're feeling good, you want to be out doing things. You want to go hiking and ride your bike and you want to travel and you know you don't want to be stuck in the kitchen. So I have taken everything that I have learned and everything that I have um, figured out that helps me work smarter, not harder in the kitchen and put it in this class. And it started out as a much smaller class. And then I kept telling Tom, I need to make another video. And he was like, oh, this thing is just like getting huge. And I said, I know, but they need to know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so we have over um, 50 recipes in here as well. I also walk you through how to organize your kitchen to make it more efficient. What equipment I find helps us be more efficient in the kitchen. What kind of containers to use to store your food. If you want to freeze food, make food ahead of time and freeze it. This course will help you understand how to do that as well. If you have a small refrigerator and you can't batch prep for a week in advance like I do, scale it down. You can batch prep for three days or four days at a time. It's very, very workable and it makes this lifestyle so much easier. If you ever have started out in the morning, you do great at breakfast and lunch, but dinner comes and, and then you think, oh, I just cannot make a meal and you cave. I've been there. That's happened to me. I have a PowerPoint presentation where I explain to you all about decision fatigue, why that happens. It's not that you don't have enough motivation. It's because it's a natural consequence of our lifestyle. If you've bought vegetables at the um, weekend with good intentions of all the wonderful healthy meals you're going to make all week, and at the end of the week, you end up throwing half of them out, I have been there. And so my course is going to help give you some structure and ideas of how you can do this easier. It's what I do is different than meal planning and meal prepping for the week where you have a set of recipes and you make a specific thing and put it in individual containers. And then that's exactly what you have to eat that week. That locks me in too much. I like a little more flexibility. So I teach you how you can make a lot of different ingredients. And then those can be pulled together and make delicious meals. We call them uh, nourish bowls, Buddha bowls, hippie bowls, plant plates, whatever you want to call it. And I can take the same batch prepped ingredients and I can flavor them a little bit differently during the week. So maybe one day I want Mediterranean, I want Italian, I love Mexican food. And so I can take those more plain ingredients that I have batch prepped on the weekend and transform them into delicious food all week. So I'm gonna start out by showing you my refrigerator so that you can see what I do. And I also talk to you about how to organize your refrigerator, how to organize your pantry, um, alphabetize your spices. All of these little things save you so much time and frustration. How to organize your utensils so you can always find what it is that you need to use. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't have a, a big refrigerator like mine, you can scale things down to whatever size your refrigerator is. But one thing that I do is I like clear containers because then when we open up the refrigerator, we can actually see all that beautiful, healthy food in there, right? So I did my batch prepping on the weekend. And so now I have all this wonderful food that we can choose from. So we have salads back here. And I teach you how to batch prep salads. So you can batch prep. I do 14 of these salads in 30 minutes, seven for Tom and seven for me so that we can have a salad as one of our main meals every day. And I'm going to show you what I do with that because I'm going to, it's actually, we're going to make our lunch while we're on here. And so I show you how to do that because that's a huge time saver. And those salads are excellent for your gut biome. 
So then I have a chipotle nacho cheese sauce because I love Mexican food and we can do a lot of different things with this. We have rice. I actually, I have sweet treats. Now, I don't eat these every day, but chocolate cookies. These are chocolate heaven cookies. It's a new recipe that's in my, um, one of the new recipes in the bundle. We can also have cornbread muffins. Tom's actually going to have a cornbread muffin with his lunch. And these are made with um, cornmeal flour and oat flour. And I actually use dates to sweeten them and plant milk. And uh, I put frozen corn in them. And they're absolutely delicious. And even the non-vegans will eat these up because they're so, so yummy. So let me pull this out. I also batch prep our potatoes and have those. I was so tired of baking potatoes every day. And then it dawned on me, why don't I make a whole tray and they can last for the week? You know, why not? I have um, a potato leek soup. That's a new recipe that's in the um, recipe ebook. I have refried beans. I have some butternut squash here. Um, that I cooked up and I used it to make the chipotle nacho cheese sauce. And here's some potatoes. So I have some of the purple potatoes, the stokes, and those deep colored potatoes have so many antioxidants. They're super healthy. And I also have Japanese sweet potatoes. I store them in the refrigerator in open containers because then they don't get soggy and we can just, we can eat them cold or we can heat them up. We can do so many wonderful things with them. They're absolutely delicious. I have, we've been eating these. I'm going to have to bake some more, but these are Yukon gold potatoes and they make the best French fries. You guys, they're so delicious. Absolutely love them. Oh, this is our chocolate chia pudding. We love this. This is actually one of our favorite desserts. And it's made with sweet potatoes and cacao powder and sweetened with dates. And then we like to put fresh raspberries on top. So delicious. You know, people go, oh, it must be so hard to eat the way you do. Are you kidding me? We eat like <laughs> kings and queens, right? It's so amazing. And then of course we have our fresh fruit down here and this is my parsley. So I learned this trick from um, Kristen Hong who has the book Fridge Love. I highly recommend her book. I actually have an interview with her that we included in the batch cooking course where she shared all kinds of tips and she shared this tip. So when you get home with your fresh herbs, uh, especially like the parsley and the um, cilantro, which I love cilantro and I, I have it almost every day because I just love that flavor. If you trim them, put them in a glass jar, water, and then cover them with like a produce bag and put them in your refrigerator, they will last for at least two weeks. Unbelievable. It works great. I used to throw cilantro away because it would go bad in about five days or so. It does not with this technique. It's amazing, amazing. So it kind of, it's kind of like having a little terrarium in your refrigerator. It's so awesome. Okay, so let's make some lunch. So Tom and I eat a chopped salad every day. It's a concept, having a salad as one of our main meals was a concept that we learned from Dr. Joel Furman. His book, Eat to Live, was the first plant-based book that I read. And so we have been doing this for 10 years, it'll be 10 years in March. So we started out having these big, beautiful salads. And I just got tired of having to pull all those vegetables out every day and prep everything to make salads. So I learned over the years, I, I've learned how to prep them so that they will last for a week. We even sometimes get nine days out of them. And it's been trial and error. I actually, I have a number of videos on YouTube because I have, you know, at, over the years learned better techniques for doing it. And so the, the one that I'm teaching you in our course is like foolproof 
for us. It's just amazing. And so I have, I've already chopped it because in about 2015, I saw Chef AJ chop a salad. And so I started chopping our salad. Oh my gosh, they are so much tastier. It just, instead of, you know, one bite having a tomato and one bite having some carrot in it, you get those flavors in every bite when you chop it. And it also reduces the volume. So it's less intimidating to sit, sit down to that big bowl of greens and veggies. You want to get a shot overhead shot. There you go. Um, and so it's super flavorful. I have seven different plants just in this bowl here. So we've got the dark leafy greens like baby kale and spinach and arugula and broccoli slaw and tomatoes and carrots and red onion and red cabbage. So lots of fiber here for the microbiome and lots of vitamins and nutrients. And so when you're feeding your body really good food, it really helps cut down on food cravings and it just makes you feel like super healthy. So that's what we start with for my base. I've got to get some dressing out. And this is my ranch dressing. You know, ranch dressing is a super popular standard American diet dressing, but we can make a really tasty one with all plants and it's delicious. And I teach you how to do that as well. I made a double batch this week and Tom is super excited. He was like, oh my gosh, do I get a jar of ranch dressing? I'm like, yes, you get a jar of ranch dressing this week. So I chopped this salad and I add my flax meal to it. So this is golden flaxseed that's ground. And I always add a tablespoon of it to my salad because I just don't taste it in my salad. And so it works out good just to put it in there. And I'm just going to kind of stir it in a bit. And I'm going to add a little bit of my ranch dressing to the base. And you can see, look at how thick that is, you guys. It's amazing. I actually use um, silk and soy um, tofu for this. And it gives you um, a bit of a nice mouth feel. And it's not as fattening as um, using cashews. And our grandson is allergic to cashews. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I'm going to add some to the top. And so I can't have any cashews in my house, cashews, hazelnuts or pistachios. And I can't, you know, use them in my blender if I'm going to use my blender for anything for him. And so we just have learned how to make everything without using cashews. And you know, cashews are used in so many vegan recipes. So I've got that and that's going to be really tasty and delicious. And then I have lots of other things that I make to add to it. So this is amazing chickpea salad. I make a lemon dill dressing that has uh, capers in it as well. And then just mash up some chickpeas. You'll get the recipe in the bundle for this. And you can, like Tom likes to eat it with a little bit of Mary's gone crackers. You can put it in pita bread. If you do pita bread, um, you could make a wrap out of it. But I love it on my salad. So I like to use a little ice cream scoop because it makes for a, just a really pretty presentation. I mean, I love how, you know, restaurants make food for you and it just looks so beautiful. They say we eat with our eyes to begin with. And so, you know, why not make your food pretty? It doesn't take that much longer to arrange it nicely. Oh, Tom, we need you to get yours going in the um, air fryer. So you may have seen me on Chef AJ um, a couple of days ago, and I made these potatoes. These are my vegan ranch twice baked potatoes. And so we're going to heat a couple of these up and put some cheese sauce on them and then some ranch dressing. And that's going to be for Tom. So I'm going to pop these in the air fryer for him. Got to move my flowers so I don't heat my flowers up. And with the air fryer, you can heat things up without oil and get them crispy. 
And so we love our air fryer and we use it like every day to make all kinds of delicious things. You can have French fries and you can do all kinds of veggies in there. And then another thing that I like to do is I like to oven roast a pan or two of veggies every week. And it just depends on what we have, what I do, but I have a little bit of sweet potato in it. Sometimes I also do some Yukon gold potatoes, red onions. I had yellow squash and zucchini squash this week. I had some um, yellow and orange peppers. If I have eggplant, I'll do eggplant. I also had Brussels sprouts. I threw some Brussels sprouts in. If the trick is to not overcook them. If you do them a little bit al dente, then when you heat them up, they don't turn to mush. And then I just season them kind of a little bit plain this week with just like onion powder, garlic powder, a little bit of black pepper, some salt substitute, because then I can change the flavor. I can make them Italian with some Italian seasoning if I want. I can make them Mediterranean. I can add some um, oregano to them if I want them to go that way. I can make them Mexican if I want. I can add some cumin and some chili powder. And so see, I can have more variety. It's the same dish, but I can change it up throughout the week. So I'm just gonna add some of these. You can heat them up if you want, or you can have them cold. And I'm perfectly happy to have them cold because they're so delicious. But you could add these to you know a plate of rice and some greens, and you could add beans. You could add black beans if you're gonna go for Mexican. You could add cannellini beans if you're just gonna go for Italian. You can add garbanzo beans if you want it to be Mediterranean. So just get lots of variety that way. Then I'm, these are some, you do an overhead shot. These are my smoky mushrooms. These are so delicious. They're absolutely addictive, super easy to make. They're just baby Bellas and some balsamic vinegar. I use the California, um, the, uh, uh, oh, it's the, what's the hickory smoke, California balsamic. But if you don't have that available, you can use a little bit of liquid smoke and then some garlic powder, onion powder, some smoked paprika and a little bit of dried mustard. And then I just, I bake them because I can put them in the oven and I don't have to worry about them. If I saute them on the stove, I've got to stay right there. And so I want to be able to do other things while they're cooking and they're so delicious and you can add them to so many different things. So I'm going to pop those in here because they add so much flavor. And people tell me that they don't like mushrooms, but they absolutely love these. And one lady sent me a picture of her granddaughter, her 13-year-old granddaughter, who told her, I don't like mushrooms. And her granddaughter was picking them off the baking sheet, eating them when they came out of the oven. So even people who don't think they like mushrooms will like these. Then this is one of those Stokes potatoes. They're the purple potatoes and the purple potatoes have the most nutrients. So I didn't used to like these, but I would buy them and fix them for Tom. And what's interesting is that our tastes change over time. So the longer we are eating this way, our, our neural adaptation of our taste buds changes. So things that we didn't like in the beginning, we can end up liking. It's so interesting how that happens. And now I absolutely love these. It's so crazy. And, you know, you want to eat the rainbow. So you want to try to have as many different colored vegetables as you can in every meal. And then berries. I love berries. So I eat berries every day. And if you can't get fresh ones right now, it's perfectly okay to use frozen and frozen vegetables are okay too. In fact, the nice thing about the frozen fruits and vegetables is that the work is already done for you, right? Because they've been cleaned and they've been trimmed and they've been cut up. And so, and you don't have to worry about waste because you can pull out just the amount that you want and um, put the rest back in the freezer. So they're going to 
you know, not go to waste. You don't have to worry about getting them made before they go bad. So I always like to add a little bit of fruit to my salads because it adds flavor and a different texture. It adds a little bit of sweetness as well. And then I know that you're a big fan of broccoli sprouts, Stephanie. <laughs> and so, um, and Tom and I are too. I actually sprout my own and it's very easy and it's very inexpensive to do so. And I just do it in a quart size canning jar. And then I bought the little sprouting screen lid from Amazon and it's super easy. And you can do this for, for pennies every week. So like every four days I start a new jar and then Tom and I like to put them in. So I saw in the bundle that there is a book all about sprouting, mm -hmm. growing microgreens and um, what's the other one? Oh, like, um, uh, yeah, fermenting. Yeah. Yeah. fermenting. Yeah. And so Tom wants to learn how to do fermenting. And so yeah. I'm so excited. I do buy microgreens. And I know if we learned how to make them ourselves, that we could save money because Tom's like, man, we spend a fortune on those and we do, but they're so amazing, but we need to learn how to grow them because everybody tells me that it's super, super easy. So yeah. Hey, Tammy. Here, yeah. Oh, I was just going to tell you real quick. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, broccoli sprout, because I, I don't know, I have a microgreens business. Like I sell microgreens to farmers markets yeah. and restaurants. But um, broccoli sprouts are basically almost the thing that will address all of those mechanisms of cancer in a food item. But they repair DNA damage. They pull carcinogens out of your bloodstream. And they actually eliminate cancer stem cells. I mean, it's, it's the research on broccoli sprouts is amazing. So you, you can go to nutritionfacts.org and type in broccoli sprouts and just watch Dr. Greger's videos. Yeah, they, they are so amazing. We, um, we had Doug Evans on, he wrote the book, a book on sprouting and um, we had him on, we interviewed him. So we have a video um, with him on and, you know, I was asking him um, like, how long will they last? And, you know, how, you know, um, you know, how long is it safe to eat them after I've grown them? And he said, stop growing so many at one time. Why can't you grow a small amount and just, you know, every few days make more. And I was like, right. ah, okay, that's a good idea. So, um, so now that's what I do. And so batch prep I don't know, you don't batch prep the sprouts. And so this is what I eat every day, some version of this. And just look at all of that amazing color. And the other day when I sat down to eat it, I said to Tom, why wouldn't everybody want to eat like this? You know, this is like so amazing. It's not only it's beautiful, but it's absolutely delicious. And you feel so good when you get done eating it. And one thing, because I was listening to, um, Dr. Um, B talk about gut health and how we need to have more diversity, even on our plant-based diet, include more plant diversity throughout the week. And so what I started doing is having more variety and just taking a smaller amount mm -hmm. of everything, you know, so like some days instead of, instead of having the beans, I'll have grains, but instead of one grain, I'll cook like three of them together that cook at the same time. And then the, it kind of creates like a peel off then. And so even if I only take a half a cup of it, I'm getting three different grains in one serving, you know? And so, and then I mix it up. I'll have some tempeh some days and I might have some, a little bit of tofu and, you know, and just try to change it up so that I'm getting a lot of different uh, variety all the time. So it's super simple. It's super easy. If you don't want this to be on a bed of chopped salad, you could just put all of that stuff that I put on top. You could put that in a bowl and all of that together could be a meal. Sometimes I want a hot dish and not a cold salad because of the ingredients that I use in my batch prep salads, I can actually saute them because I don't have any lettuce in there. Technically arugula is lettuce, but it's perfectly delicious when it's cooked. And so I can water saute that in a skillet. 
and it turns out great. If something happens, if we're going on vacation and at the, you know, the day that we're leaving, we've still got a couple salads left. I pop them in the freezer and I freeze them. When we get home, we have that as our meal as, as a hot dish that night because, you know, we've been gone. So we haven't grocery shop and we can open up a can of beans and add some garbanzo beans or something to them instead. And so they're extremely versatile or we can chop them up and we can add them to a brothy soup. So, you know, they just don't go to waste. And that was one thing, you know, I, I got tired of throwing things out. And so I try to think of how I can make things now and repurpose them, use them differently. So, so this is lunch. And then for, so I have my chopped salad at lunch. Tom prefers something else. He usually likes soup at lunchtime. And so in the evening, he makes himself a chopped salad. And oftentimes his is Mexican because you can do them so different. So like last night he had refried beans and rice and corn and salsa on it. And that, you know, so but the base was the same as mine that I have here. And so you can make them completely different flavors and we never get tired of it. We've been doing it for 10 years and we never get tired of it. And so I show you in the, in the course how to make soups and how to freeze them. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a wonderful way to be able to eat healthy and not be overwhelmed. Because that's what I want. I want everybody to be able to do this long term. And so one, you have to find the food that you love. And two, you have to find an easy way to have that food ready. Because if your fridge is full of delicious, healthy food that's ready to heat and eat, mm -hmm. then you'll make better choices. So it's all about prep, being mm -hmm. prepared. But your organizational skills are amazing, Tammy. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my strength. I, when the bundle is over, I, that's the first thing I'm going to do is go through your batch course step by step. <laughs> Great. That makes me so happy. It does. Because, you know, um, when Tom retired, was that 15 or 2016? Um, he said, okay, we need a mission, you know, for retirement. And he's like, you kind of, you kind of started that YouTube channel and, you know, you've got the whole food plant-based thing going, you know, do you want to pursue that? And um, so we decided, yeah, that would be a really great thing. We could probably save people a lot of time if we shared with them what we have discovered that works. And like this class is the class that I wish I had had when I went plant-based because it would have saved me from being stressed out. And, you know, then I could have adopted this method way back then. But, um, and so that's why we, you know, we love doing what we do because we want people to be able to sustain this lifestyle long-term and, you know, like us, we wanted to do it, but we just didn't know how to do it. So Jim Powell has a question. Sure. I'll take questions. Is there a set rule of thawing those frozen fruits to, and you, they can't hear me. Um, is there a set rule on thawing those frozen fruits to use in the salad? Um, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. So the question is, is there a rule about how to thaw out the fruit? If you want to use frozen fruit in your salad, you know, just take it out of, out of the freezer. I would say about a half hour or so before, and now I'm using fresh fruit in this We're we're very spoiled. We live in California and <laughs> we can get fresh berries all year long. And, you know, we, all of our produce is extremely fresh because it doesn't have to travel very far, but, um, I have lots of friends who live in other places that rely on frozen fruit in the winter time. And so you just take it out about a half hour, let it sit on the counter so that it thaws out a bit. It will uh, create a little bit of juice when it thaws out, but that's perfectly okay because that adds flavor mm -hmm. to your greens and to your salad. And what we find when we add fruit, and a lot of people tell me it's true for them as well, is that you need less salad dressing then because everything has so much flavor 
and that fruit is juicy. And so, and when you chop your salad, it releases the natural juices that are in all the vegetables. Cause I have tomatoes in there and red onions and even the greens, when you chop the greens, it releases juices and it just makes the salad that much more flavorful. And so you do actually need less dressing. Um, and sometimes we don't use any dressing at all because everything that we've put on top of it is so flavorful. So look at how gorgeous. Do you want to do the overhead shot, Tom? These came out so good, but we're not done because we're going to add, I have the chipotle nacho cheese sauce. So these, these are just russet potatoes. And um, I have the video from making these on Chef AJ is on our YouTube channel. And the recipe for this is on the blog. And we have a link to that in that other oh, video, Tammy's potato, Tam Tammy's potato party. And so I've got broccoli in here. Again, we love broccoli. It's so healthy. We try to get it in where we can. And I, you know, just mashed, baked the potatoes, then cut them open. You can, even if you have these batch baked, you can take the cold batch baked potatoes and um, they're very easy then to cut, cut in half, scoop out the inside. I mash it with some of my ranch dressing. I steam some broccoli, add the broccoli, a little bit of garlic powder, onion powder, black pepper. Um, I use salt substitute just to give them a lot of flavor, stuff them back in here. Then you bake them. If you want, you can freeze these as well. You can batch up a whole bunch of them and freeze them. Mm -hmm. Super Bowl Sunday's coming up. These would be perfect for Super Bowl Sunday. If you use the smaller potatoes, like the golden potatoes, you could actually make them like a finger food and people could just pick them up. So that chipotle nacho cheese sauce will just heat a little bit of that up. We're going to put that over the top and then we're going to drizzle ranch dressing over the top. And it's to die for. So, so it's delicious. I mean, we, we eat really well here. And every, I think everybody that we know that eats plant-based loves the food. Mm -hmm. They just love the food. I know I keep looking at the screen because the camera's up so high today. It's up way higher. Usually he put, I know, usually he has the camera closer to the screen for me, but it's way up high today. Yeah, and you know I'm how so they say, sick. Tammy, you don't, you shouldn't live to eat. You should eat to live. I'm like, nope, I, I, I still <laughs> live to eat on, on a plant-based diet because I love the food so much. I'm just always thinking about what I'm going to make for my next meal. Yeah. yeah. I love food too. And we can still be a foodie and mm -hmm. enjoy the food and be creative. And, you know, most of the time we eat pretty simple just because once you neuroadapt, you're very happy with just plain and simple food because it all tastes so good. You know, you can actually taste the sweetness in the carrots and in the cucumbers. And, you know, you can taste the saltiness in celery and Swiss right. chard. And, you know, your, your sense of taste really does change. And it's, you know, so everything just tastes that much better because we're not, um, you know, using oil, and salt and sugar to mask the natural flavors of our food. And it's so filling too. It's like, you know, we get to eat large quantities of food. It, you know, we're not back when I was dieting all the time and trying to moderate what I was eating. And, you know, I was weighing out little portions and measuring everything and then leaving the meal hungry. That doesn't happen. Yeah. You need we to open a restaurant, Tammy. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll no, fly we, out and eat there. <laughs> we, we know people and they're a slave to it. You're already married to one problem. Yeah, I know. You're, when you have a restaurant, you're a slave to it. And, you know, we want to, um, you know, do more hiking and bike riding and just, you know, have uh, spare time because we feel good. So we want to do all those fun things. So, mm, all right. All right. Well, well this, this has been so much fun. We totally encourage everybody. You've got to get the bundle because for $49, um, you know, just, I mean, between Stephanie's course and my course, you know, it's worth the $49 right mm -hmm. there. Plus you're going to get hundreds more things that, um, there's something in the bundle for everybody. Yeah. So, well, mm -hmm. this has been so much fun. 
Yeah, I really appreciate you for having me on, Tammy. I mean, and yes, I can't wait to go through your course. So you, uh, I was not blessed with your organizational skills. So I, I'll tell you, I already, like I already kind of like paged through it and I already started mixing up my spices. Like I make this broccoli cheese soup every week. And so I did the trick where, like you say, to put them all in one jar. I'm like, by God, I'm going to make that tonight. It'll take me half the time. So it does because you don't have to get. So what she's talking about is if you, if you have certain recipes that you make like every week, Mm -hmm. instead of dragging out all those spices every week, set up four empty bottles and fill them with the spices for that recipe. And then the next time you go to make it, it's so much faster. And I also do that with, I have my um, banana uh, quinoa banana oat muffins that I make on a regular basis. So I measure out all the dry ingredients for uh-huh. those as well. It's like making my own quick mix. Yeah. And, um, and I even some, they require pureed bananas. And if I have a lot of ripe bananas all at once, I'll go ahead and puree them and divide those up into containers. And then our daughter is a busy mom of three. She homeschools three children under the age of six. And so I make up um, dry mix uh, muffin mixes for her and I puree the bananas and I put them in little containers. You know, it's just something that I can do to save her time. And Monday morning, she sent me a picture of pulling um, blueberry muffins out. And she said, thanks to grandma we're having hot muffins out of the oven this morning on a busy Monday morning. And, you know, just those things, doing those things. And she does that with her waffle and her pancakes, her plant-based, because she's plant-based too. She does that with her plant-based waffle and pancake mixes. When she gets everything out, then she'll um, make like four, four dry mix batches. And that way, it's really quick when she goes to make them. So, um, and I share a lot of her tips that she's figured out for a family as well in that batch cooking course. Amazing. Wow. So any other questions, Tom? Um, um, no, I don't think so. Let's have, um, Stephanie stay in the waiting room while we sign off. Okay. We'll come back to her. We're going to say goodbye. You stay in the waiting room and, um, okay. Sounds good. All All right. right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was just um, fantastic. Stephanie's presentation was amazing. And it's one of those that we can share with people who ask us, where do you get your protein? And um, those people who are doing keto and um, those people who are plant curious. And so, and then look for her. She's going to be, I believe she said on Chef AJ on Wednesday. So please Um, follow her there as well and look up her YouTube channel if you would too. And if you or anyone you know could use her kickstart program, um, please sign up for that. Uh, As you can see, she is a wonderful teacher, explains things in an easy manner. So I want to thank Jesse for hopping on and helping us in the chat, as well as Tom. Thank you, Tom. And um, if you want the bundle, we have a link in the um, underneath in the description and uh, we'll be on again. I can't remember right now. I have to look at the schedule, but um, Tom sent out an email. If you're on our email list, you've got a schedule of a lot of what I'm doing. And I'm on Instagram live and Facebook live and multiple times a day uh, until uh, through Sunday. So thanks a lot for joining us. I'm Tammy and I help you get healthy and stay healthy one meal at a time. Bye for now.